Of all the corporate bailouts that have taken place over the last year, none has proved more costly or contentious than the rescue of American International Group, AIG. Its reckless bets on subprime mortgages threatened to bring down Wall Street and the world economy last fall until the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve stepped in to save it. So far, the huge insurance and financial services conglomerate has been given or promised $180 billion in loans, investments, financial injections, and guarantees, a sum greater than the annual cost of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. In return, the U.S. taxpayers have been given a 79% equity stake in the company. We are now AIG's largest shareholder. We have 116,000 loyal employees who had nothing to do with this mess, some valuable insurance assets, and a new CEO, Edward Liddy, who says his only mission is to get our money back. I think we have almost a, a unique place and not a very desirable place in terms of the anger and frustration that Americans feel about bailouts. You know, individuals aren't being bailed out. Why should a company be bailed out? So I understand it. We're just trying to do the best we can to pay back the taxpayer. Good morning, all. <laughs> For the past eight months, Ed Liddy's job has been to prevent AIG from collapsing trying to extricate the company from its disastrous trades and selling off the crown jewels of what was once one of the world's great businesses, all to satisfy its massive debt to Uncle Sam. Are there people from the government on this floor? There aren't people from the government on this floor, but I would guess uh, today there's probably 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 people either in our building or over at the Federal Reserve, which is a couple of blocks away, worrying and thinking about uh, things related to AIG. They come to our board meetings. They come to our committee meetings. We have them in any strategic meetings, any decisions to buy assets, to sell assets. They're involved in those. It's a thankless job that Liddy neither sought nor particularly wanted. He'd retired from the chairmanship of the Allstate Insurance Company and was serving on the board of Goldman Sachs when Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson, Goldman's former chairman, asked him to take over AIG. Liddy agreed to do it for a salary of $1 a year. Whatever possessed you to take this job for $1 a year? I think like much of your audience, if somebody calls and says, could you please help your country, people say yes. With respect to a dollar a year, I knew I'd have to make some tough decisions. I didn't want in any way, shape, or form people to question my integrity, my honesty as to why I was doing it. Did you have any idea what you were getting into? In some regards, I did, and in some regards, I didn't. So certainly understanding how to restructure a company, I've done that before. The political issues, how you relate to the Federal Reserve or Treasury or the Congress, that's new and sometimes terrifying to me. Especially the Congress. Especially the Congress, yes. Do you have anything to say for yourself? Yes, sir, I do. But he Wait, didn't get much of a chance to say it a few months ago when Congress raked him over the coals for paying out $165 million in bonuses to some of the very people who helped wreck AIG. The bonus deals had been signed before Liddy got there. I take offense, sir, at, at the use well, of Well, offense was intended, so you, you take it rightfully, sir. It's difficult to sit there and have 30 or 35 people uh, throwing barbs at you and, and really not appreciating that you're on their side and you're trying to help. Did you know how bad things were when you took this job? No, no, not at all. Not long after Liddy arrived, AIG reported the largest quarterly loss in U.S. history, more than $60 billion during the final three months of last year. The sprawling holding company that controlled some of the biggest insurance companies in the world owned and leased more jet aircraft than most of the major airlines and provided investment income for pensions, municipalities, and other institutions had its tentacles everywhere. And the threat of collapse walked the global financial system to the edge of an abyss. I know you're not to blame for any of this, but you are the current proprietor, so to speak. Big picture, what happened? We strayed from our core skills. In the late 80s, we, we put in something called AIGFP. It wasn't an insurance company. It's a company that dealt in very sophisticated financial products. It was a hedge fund, right? It was a hedge fund. With offices in London and Connecticut, AIG Financial Products had fewer than 500 employees, but it made enough bad deals to destroy the rest of the company. The division was created by longtime AIG chairman Maurice Hank Greenberg, who was forced to resign after an accounting scandal in 2005 and was succeeded by Martin Sullivan. 
Like most of Wall Street, AIGFP became enamored with the amounts of money to be made in the subprime mortgage market. Not only did AIG buy billions of the now toxic mortgage-backed securities, people in the financial products division looked at their computer models and decided that the securities were so safe they could make tons of money insuring them for other investors who bought them. These private insurance contracts were called credit default swaps and would ultimately expose the giant conglomerate to $64 billion in potential subprime mortgage losses. And when the housing bubble burst, AIG didn't have enough money to meet its obligations. Ultimately, at the end of the day, how many people brought down this company? Oh, 20 or 30. No, there were 20 a lot. or 30? How can 20 or 30 people bring down a company the size of AIG? I mean, that requires a lot of failures, doesn't it? No. On the part of a lot of different people, on the people in risk management. You know, uh, Steve, I, I don't necessarily see it that way. I think it requires a belief that models are always right and human intervention won't offset them. It, it assumes that the kinds of risks that were viewed to be so remote could not occur. But in fact, they did occur. This was a pretty colossal screw up, you would agree? Yeah, I'd say in hindsight, uh, if, if the people that made that decision had to do over again, my guess would be that they would not do it. What they did was that, that they underwrote the credit bubble in the U.S. They held up a sign and they said, we're ready to buy the stuff. It was a cash cow for them. They liked it. They loved the business. And they backstopped the credit bubble in the whole economy. Rich Ferlato is director of pension investments for the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, whose pension plans lost $4.3 billion with AIG. He blames company executives, the board of directors, and a compensation system that rewarded short-term profits while ignoring long-term risks. Why do you think the people at AIGFP took these risks? For the most part, I don't think they saw the risk. They knew the risk was out there, but they were driven because they thought they could make a buck. They were sort of blindsided by the ability to make short-term money. And it was more than a buck. This is the kind of money that most average people only, only dream of, and then some. It's like hitting the jackpot every year. At AIG Financial Products, more than 30% of the profits were paid out in compensation, and no one benefited more than Joseph Cassano, who oversaw the London operation that brought AIG down. Cassano, who was holed up in his London apartment, has declined all requests for interviews. Have you ever met Joe Cassano? I never have. But he's clearly one of the 20 people who helped wreck this company. Joe Cassano ran FP for a number of years. According to these figures, I have, he made $43 million in 2006, $24 million in 2007, total of $280 million over the course of the eight years. Do you believe that, that he was more concerned with the values uh, uh, and the survival of AIG than he was about his own compensation? Based upon those numbers, it doesn't sound like it, but that's pure speculation on my part. Cassano continued to defend his investment strategy even after the subprime mortgage crisis reared its ugly head in the summer of 2007. On a conference call with Wall Street analysts, he said there was nothing to worry about. We see no dollar of loss associated with any of that business. He was off by more than $40 billion. Do you think that Mr. Cassano knew that everything was all right in August 2007 when he made that statement? Steve, I, I, I don't know what he was thinking. You mean like, I don't know what he was thinking? I mean like, I, I don't know what he was thinking. Either he didn't know what was going on, which is a kind of frightening prospect, or he did, which would suggest that he and maybe others at AIGFP engaged in a massive fraud over a period of years. It's one of those two choices. Frank Pardnoy is a law professor at the University of San Diego and an expert on the kinds of complicated financial derivatives that ruined AIG. The fraud would be not disclosing the fact, and it turned out to be a fact, that AIG had significant exposure to subprime mortgages. Partnoy says AIG didn't tell its shareholders about its risky positions until June of 2007. And even then, the disclosure was limited to a single sentence buried in a 96-page report. The conduct of AIG's financial products division and its CEO, Joseph Cassano, is now the subject of wide-ranging investigations by the Securities and Exchange Commission and the FBI. 
and that has made Ed Liddy's job even more difficult. The first thing I did in was walk in the door and say, AIG, FP, we're going to shut it down. We are not going to be in that business. But you still have employees that are working at, at FP, winding the business down. They, they are, that's correct. They're still getting paid, and they're still getting bonuses. Mm -hmm. you, you may have said, let's shut it down, but you're not out of that business yet. No, we are not out of business, and it'll take a while for us to be out of it. But we will, we will substantially de-risk and shrink that business by the end of this year. People will be surprised by how much progress we make. Since Liddy took over, he says the troubled, volatile entity has disposed of half of its complex derivative investments. But another 27,000 deals valued at $1.5 trillion are still on the books. We spoke to someone who's intimately familiar with, uh, with AIG financial products, and, and he told us that out of the 10 or 20 people who were really involved in the decision-making process, only two have left the company, that everybody else is still there. Is that true? Steve, we have, we have had some resignations. We've had some people who have said, I'm going to resign. I'm not going to give you my resignation now because I want to do this professionally and I want to help you. But it, is it true that, that, that only two have left? To the extent there are people who traded credit default swaps, some of them may still be there because we're asking them to untrade them. But the people who designed it, who, who built those models, who signed us up for that business, they are gone. Retired, handsome, comfortably retired. Retired, left, went and did other things. We asked to speak with some of the employees at AIGFP and visit their offices in Wilton, Connecticut. Liddy declined, but provided us with this video of the operation. He said people there were still traumatized from the threats and harassment leveled against them during the recent bonus controversy, and no one wanted to talk to us. Plus loads of people wound up uh, on, their, on their lawns, taking pictures, you know, picketing in front of their houses. Just not a good idea for us to get back into that. Liddy believes the public anger directed against the company and its employees is misguided and counterproductive, making it more difficult to hold on to the people it needs to keep the company going and undermining the value of its most successful and profitable assets, which he is trying to sell. Just this week, the company unloaded its Tokyo office building for $1.2 billion. The AIG brand, once a huge asset, is quickly vanishing. Even the iconic Manhattan headquarters is up for sale. So you are, in effect, the liquidator? Well, th there'll be pieces of, I don't think it'll be called AIG, but there will be pieces of this institution left. It'll be much smaller and it'll look a whole lot different. But that's the only choice we have. That's the only way we can pay back the government. All of it? That's what we're committed to doing. He's got, he's got a very tough job ahead of him. I don't envy him at all. You seem to be saying that AIG is still not out of the woods. If the economy deteriorates anymore, I think there's more there are more problems out there. We're not an island. We're very much dependent upon what happens in the overall economy and the overall financial marketplace. But we have a plan that we'll execute over the next couple of years that we think has an excellent chance of repaying the federal government.